This is one of my personal favorite interviews that we've done so far. We think it's timely, we think it's relevant, and we hope it informs you and your design team to be more aware about designing for diversity. Let's get into the show. Support for Design Better comes from Gusto, who make running a small business easy. Get three months free at gusto.com slash design better once you run your first payroll. Running a small business is hard work, especially all of the payroll, quarterly tax filing stuff, and HR things. I'd rather be focused on my business and my customers than dealing with the administrative duties. But Gusto makes it easy. They automate the complicated parts of running a business. With Gusto, I never miss federal or state payroll tax filings, and I love the time off requests and time tracking tools. Gusto even offers a small group health insurance option for nearly any budget. When you run into issues you need help with, their HR experts are ready to help. It's a very well-designed product, easy to use, and great emotional design that will put a smile on your face. Design Better listeners get three months free once they run their first payroll. Just go to gusto.com slash design better. That's gusto.com slash design better. I've worked with lots of search firms, both as a leader searching for new talent for my teams and as an individual exploring new steps in my career. But I trust none more than Wirt & Company. Since 1995, Wirt & Company has been the design community's most trusted search firm, co-founded by a designer and led by a CEO who has in-house operational startup experience. Wirt & Company is guided by the principle that creative leadership is essential to business success. They've helped some of the most admired brands from early stage startup to Fortune 500 build world-class creative teams. We're talking about companies like Airbnb, The New York Times, The Four Seasons, Notion, Figma, Google, Cartier, and Fair. Not bad. If you're looking for a partner to help you find the right person for a critical role, look no further than Wirt and Company. And if you're looking for your next design leadership role, Wirt and Company will guide you through the process as a friend and a champion throughout your journey. They take the time to get to know you, to understand what you need professionally and personally. Whether you're looking for your next role or your next team member, Wirt and Company can help you find a meaningful relationship. Visit wirtco.com to learn more and get in touch. That's W E R T C O.com. Boywen Gao and Jahan Manton, thanks so much for joining us on the Design Better podcast. Yeah. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. So We've got a lot to talk about. You've done a lot of interesting work around designing for diversity. And we want to talk about the framework that you've been building and how you're helping design teams in particular solve some of these problems. But maybe we could start from the beginning. So Project Inkblot, how did that start? How did you two come together in this endeavor? Boy, when and I met as music and culture editors at a now defunct magazine. And what magazine? It was called Beyond Race. What was actually really cool about this magazine is it was like a genre less magazine. Like they covered different artists from all different types of musical genres. And a lot of the artists were doing like connected to social impact endeavors or, you know, social issues, quote unquote. And it was a small team. It was a quarterly, right? Yeah. Publication and, you know, independently run and kind of scrappy, but it was a really great experience. And we met there and it was funny because we were just talking the other day about, wow, you know, when we met and you meet people all the time and you don't know that years later we would have been doing this type of work together. Mm -hmm. Like if somebody would have told us that, it would have been like, what, you know, but maybe not so much because it actually was really aligned with what we're really passionate about. And as we got to know one another, there was just a lot of overlap and things that we were genuinely just really passionate about. Like we were really passionate about art and culture and cultural criticism and uh, travel and uh, people of color, women, women of color in particular, being in a place of true power and self-expression. And mm-hmm. we just saw over and over again that there were so many women of color in particular in our communities that were doing really great work that was just not being highlighted. And we were like, wow, this is amazing. There's this woman that started this drumming magazine that was for women drummers. The first Yemeni woman photographer, which is insane in Yemen. I mean, when we met her and she was talking about that particular story, you know, she had people coming up to her like, why are you wearing a camera around your neck? 
What are you doing with that? Mm. What's that for? Mm -hmm. And basically, you know, to make a long story short, because we came from a publishing background, because we were writers, because we were really passionate about this, we ended up putting together an online magazine where we profiled those people that I just mentioned and tons of other people and put together a team of contributors and profiled really interesting folks from around the world. And when we look back now, we can see that part of the reason was because we were so fascinated with how do people create the things that they create? And we've always Mm -hmm. been really fascinated by the creative process. Like, how do you get an idea that's in your head to actually manifest in real life out in the world? And because we were practicing and learning how to do that, we wanted to know how other people had done it. And we love interviewing, we love listening to people's stories and really mm-hmm. kind of collated this really great groups of folks that we profiled. And that led to us running our own creative series for folks that wanted to bring these ideas into action. So we've always, I think, been obsessed with process and frameworks and um, storytelling and storytelling. And narrative making and all those things. And we kind of fell into consulting in a weird way. Maybe it's not so weird, but we started working with companies and we we fell into this niche for a bit where we were building in real life programs for women entrepreneurs. We found that through this process, that's when we really started to, I I don't want to say that we started to notice because this has been, it had been something we'd noticed for a long time, <laughs> really our whole lives. Right. Yeah. But we, it became really clear when we were working with these companies that we have defaults that are always there. As individuals, we have it as teams, as companies, and we resort to these defaults all the time. And in the case of mm-hmm. you know building out a lot of these women entrepreneurship programs, we saw that a lot of these programs, in the way they speak about it, in the way it's marketed, is geared towards women that have achieved a degree of higher education, that tend to be Mm -hmm. wealthy, that tend to be white. And we were like, you know, the world of women's entrepreneurship is so much bigger than just that. And certainly that perspective should be included. But for it to be the dominant one or the only one doesn't result in the best type of program that you could make. And so we began being this kind of like cultural bridge, bringing in Mm -hmm. these communities. And as we'll get into in more detail, we just saw that actually everyone can do this. We're all capable of starting to think right from the start when we're creating whatever it is that we're building. Who are we excluding? Who are we not Mm -hmm. considering? What might be the impact on communities if we don't include them? And also, what are the opportunities when we do include them? So you're both creative thinkers as writers and storytellers and appreciation of music as well. How did you find your way into, I mean, it seems like you're involved in the tech industry a fair bit. And so bringing some of that thinking about diversity and inclusion to the tech world, clearly the tech world needs a lot of support on these topics. That's my my view, at least. What's the bridge there in your story of, of how you You came together, you found this connection with entrepreneurship for women, especially underrepresented women. How did you then bridge over to the tech industry and design? Yeah, well, the work that we were doing for a really long time with the magazine, with our series, with even the consulting was very hyper local for a while, Mm. right? And we were like, okay, well, if we're codifying this process, and one thing to say here is that this conversation is way, way bigger than diversity and inclusion. We even put the third word in here, which is not prevalent in the business world, which is equity. So diversity to us, I think it's really important to just level set here. Diversity to us is really who's in the room, what's the composition. Inclusion is not just about how do you get somebody to belong to your company culture, or it's not just about belonging, but asking the question, what are we asking people to belong to? And then are we regarding diverse folks as decision makers ultimate decision makers, people with power in these situations. And so equity for us are like, what are the systems and processes that uphold the commitment to diversity and inclusion? So that's a much bigger conversation than just composition and do people belong. And so if we're looking at just the macro world and everything that's happening politically, globally, all these social movements and things that are just happening that we can't ignore, right? They, they impact every aspect of life and business is that mm. jumping to tech for us was just looking at what industry needs this the most because what is the industry mm-hmm. that is creating the most global impact that is potentially harmful 
And that goes back to what Jahan was saying about intention versus impact. And there's so many through lines. You can look at a field like social impact. And I think as a culture, we just default to thinking that social impact is good impact. We conflate these things, but impact can also be negative impact. So how do we start thinking about these things? And why this is bigger than just a diversity and inclusion conversation is that everybody, no matter where you live around the world, you have cultural defaults. There are things you can call them biases, you can call them whatever you want, but the truth of the matter is that it's limiting in terms of what the possibilities are and what you're creating, what you're building, and how, and the mm-hmm. implications on the people that those things are for. So I think that that's a really important thing to just say up front is that this is not a diversity inclusion only conversation, which I think we've just inherited this world of diversity and inclusion being like, it's over here. It's this thing that is to the side. It's we, we know it's good. We got to think about it. It's, you know, it's a moral thing or it's a right thing or it's a business case. And it's really so much bigger than that because it really is embedded into every single thing that we do and every single experience that we have as humans on this planet now is what are the implications of our cultural defaults on the, the future that we're creating? Curious how you both thought about, you know, design as a pathway into this endeavor. You could have obviously picked different things to consult Uh, with companies on, but it sounds like you landed it on design. And I'm curious why that was and what kind of got you to where you are now in that realm. I think design is an invitation. Design, unlike if we talk about just diversity and inclusion, it's not that inviting to people. (laughs) I mean, honestly, if someone's like, hey, do you guys want to go to diversity and inclusion workshop? We're like, no. Not really. (laughs) Right. (laughs) But it's if we frame diversity as a design process or if we frame equity as a design process or any of these things, then it's like, oh, well, there's some curiosity there. There's some discovery to be had. There's some thinking about, okay, well, what am I defaulting to in how I'm thinking about decision making or building a product or staffing a team? Every single thing is, you know, has a design process and design sure. implications. And so that really to us was like, oh, this is such an opportunity to invite people into the conversation that we want to have that, again, is bigger than diversity and inclusion. But I think that's also a starting point for people to think about, okay, we already know that this is a missing. So how do we address that piece? And then we get to really blow it out of the water and ex- explore it even further with them. Again, the future that we're creating for humanity. I know that sounds really like... Kumbaya, but you know, that's, that's not what I mean. Yeah. I like that question also, Eli, because I think what you're pointing at is the language that we're intentionally using for things to shift. We know that people need to believe that they can solve it. We need Mm -hmm. to think, we need to believe that we can make a dent here and we need to believe that it matters to us. Mm -hmm. That for me individually, this makes a difference for me. And because of the history of racism in this country, there's nowhere near being resolved, you know, and because of sexism and all these other isms, there are like all these things that make it really challenging for us to talk about, especially in a mixed company. We're not taught how to speak about it. We Mm -hmm. were afraid to say the wrong thing. We're afraid to do the wrong things, all of those things. And so how do we actually make this a conversation that we can at least begin to participate in, in a way that if you care about this, if you're about this, if you're like, yeah, I genuinely want to shift something here, then we can all be in that conversation. Designing to us is a product of being a human being. We always say you design your route to work. You design what you put on in the morning. You design all of these things and we're doing it consciously. We're doing it unconsciously. And we think that's super empowering because that means that we have agency Mm -hmm. and we can redesign and it's not easy and it takes people and it takes team and accountability and compassion and grace and all those things. But we refuse to believe that everything is just the way it is. And that's just the way it is. There's nothing you can do about it. We have many examples of folks who are doing great work adjacent to us, similar to us, that are really thinking about how to redesign and not just thinking, but acting on it. And again, because we love to create and design and ideate and build, it's because of our experience, you know, personal and professional experience that we were like, this is so doable, We've gotten to the end stage of whatever it is that we're building. And there are all these things that have been left out. And it 
it causes so much more stress and reactionary reaction from folks, Mm -hmm. you know, and like how to correct or how to modify or completely unaware. And it doesn't need to be that way. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Let's talk about that a little bit more. So something I have noticed, so 50% of my family is black and we talk about race a lot. And one of the things that we have noticed is that families, especially white families, we've talked to other families about this, that if they're all white, they feel like, hey, I can't really talk to other people about race because I feel like it's dangerous. Mm -hmm. And so because there's that impediment to discussion about other people's perspectives, what it's like to be a different race or different gender or whatever, they don't participate. And then that just sort of perpetuates ignorance or unaware of other people's perspectives. When you do consulting work, do you talk about things like this? How do we, if we're in teams that are, where some people feel like they're nervous about jumping into this conversation, how do you crack it open? How do you create a safe space where people could start to talk about, here are our gaps of our understanding. These are the things that we should identify and admit. Like, hey, I just, I don't have expertise on this. I want to learn. How do, how do you get, start that conversation? Well, first of all, I just want to say thanks for sharing what you said personally. And you love sharing personal information. And like, I grew up in, you know, a home where my dad was white and Jewish. My mom's Jamaican. And talking about race with my siblings, I'm one of four. It was just so common. It was just like yeah. a common thing. It was, and it wasn't a burden. It was intriguing. It was interesting. Yeah. That's just just natural conversation. It was a natural right. conversation. We were talking about systems and this and that. And I always point out, because it feels really important to me, that my dad used to always say, I'm the white father to Black children. And he's our biological father. But he really understood the way that this country has been formed and the history of racism in this country. This is how you're going to be viewed and treated. Mm-hmm. And there are things to think about in regards to that. So we were fortunate to grow up with a family and really privileged actually to grow up with a family where open communication discussion was welcomed. In regards to your question at a kind of tactical level, but when and I just like nerd out, we geek out about all these incredibly fascinating examples of equitable and inequitable design. And we have found that mm-hmm. when we open up the conversation, like, look, y'all, we're all designers. We are human. We have designed so many things we're conscious of and unconscious of. Let's think about Mm -hmm. things that have been designed in the past and in the present. Let's really get a sense of the landscape. And let's think about how we're going to create the future. So Mm -hmm. really starting with really compelling examples, that gives people something to sink their teeth in. It gives them something to dig into. It's factual. An example that we use a lot is the Kodak example, you know, in the, was it in the 60s or the 50s? Mm -hmm. Kodak had a model they used to model for their film and it was called the Shirley card. And it was always a white woman who was used Mm -hmm. as the default. And so what happens is that lighter skin or white skin becomes the norm. It becomes the Mm -hmm. default. And it's really fascinating to learn how as Kodak developed as a company, the feedback they got, not from people, Or maybe they did, we don't know, but the feedback that had them start to shift how they developed this film because darker skinned folks were not showing up well in these actual images. Mm -hmm. The feedback they received were were from chocolate makers who Mm. couldn't distinguish between milk chocolate and dark chocolate. That's crazy. Isn't it crazy? And from (laughs) furniture makers who couldn't distinguish between... I don't Dark know, kind of, rainwood and light like rainwood. Right. Yeah. That is fascinating. That is right. a fact. So when we're talking about disrupting, you know, the default, all these defaults, one of the things you want to drive home with that example is that Kodak didn't create the best product possible because yep. that default was present right at, from the beginning. Mm-hmm. And if we're really looking again at let's create the greatest X ever that's useful for more than one demographic of people. I don't personally think Kodak was being malicious. I think it was this major blind spot. Those are the things that are inevitably going to arise and we're not bringing in folks from different lived experiences. I mean, even your experience saying that 50% of your family is black as a white man, like you have a very, I imagine a very particular perspective around that. that, That's unique. Yeah, Yeah. for sure. And I think I'll just also add from a more interpersonal 
level around this because, I mean, this comes up all the time. I think our work is more around systems design and looking at a macro level and then Mm -hmm. going to an area work with the companies that we consult with. But then the interpersonal never goes away. That stuff always comes up. It's a personal thing that comes up and then there's team dynamics and then there's the company. It's really in the environments that we create that these conversations can be had. So when we come into a company for the first time and we set the tone by, okay, we're doing this very macro lens at all the things that Jahan just mentioned, these case studies, that's already setting the environment that this is a different way to have this conversation. But employers also have to think about that. Families have to think about that. No matter what environment you're in, it's like, do we set up the opportunity to be able to have these conversations? And I don't want to say a criticism free zone because that It's not realistic, but how do we then deal with these conflicts? How do we have these conversations? How do we hear each other's perspectives? And that's Mm -hmm. not just going to naturally happen because going again back to cultural defaults, it's not like this everywhere in the world. If you're in Europe, you're talking about politics at the dinner table all the time, but we don't do that. in America. We don't talk about certain topics. And so we also have to design the culture for that in very small ways and also really large ways. And that can start at your dinner table during the holidays or whatever have you. Support for Design Better comes from Uplift Desk, who help you work better and live healthier. Eli and I log a lot of hours at our desks, which can be detrimental to one's health if you're not paying attention to ergonomics. Uplift Desk offer high-quality, well-designed desks, chairs, and accessories to help you build an ergonomic workspace for home or work. Eli recently got a standing desk, and I got a human-scale freedom chair. I've been dreaming about this chair for a long time, and I finally got one. I've already noticed a big change in my posture with this chair, and my body thanks me for it. Eli is logging a lot more hours standing and sitting these days, and he can make quick transitions with the flip of a switch. We love Uplift Desk, and we know that you will too. Design Better listeners can get a special deal by visiting upliftdesk.com and use the code DESIGNBETTER at checkout for 5% off your order. You'll get free shipping, free returns, and an industry-leading 15-year warranty. Go to upliftdesk.com, use code DESIGNBETTER, and get 5% off. Design a better workspace with Uplift Desk. Support for Design Better comes from Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal delivery. Design Better listeners can save 50% on their order at factormeals.com slash designbetter50. Use the code designbetter50. You know what happens at my house when things get really busy? In the evenings, we turn to takeout, which can be expensive and it's not very good for our health. Lately, we're making a better choice at crunch time. We turn to Factor for chef-created, dietitian approved meals that are ready to eat in just two minutes. We like the flexibility of Factor, too. You can change your order up every week with plans from 4 to 18 meals per week. Or you can pause or reschedule your deliveries at any time. The meals are so tasty. My wife and I are huge fans. And I like their smoothies too, which I find are perfect for a quick, healthy breakfast. Factor can help you eat well and feel good while focusing on your career and your family. Head to factormeals.com slash designbetter50. And use the code DESIGNBETTER50 to get 50% off your order. That's code DESIGNBETTER50 at factormeals.com slash designbetter50 to get half off your order. Support for Design Better comes from Gusto, who make running a small business easy. Get three months free at gusto.com slash designbetter once you run your first payroll. Running a small business is hard work, especially all of the payroll, quarterly tax filing stuff, and HR things. I'd rather be focused on my business and my customers than dealing with the administrative duties. But Gusto makes it easy. They automate the complicated parts of running a business. With Gusto, I never miss federal or state payroll tax filings, and I love the time off requests and time tracking tools. Gusto even offers a small group health insurance option for nearly any budget. When you run into issues you need help with, their HR experts are ready to help. It's a very well-designed product, easy to use, and great emotional design that will put a smile on your face. Design Better listeners get three months free once they run their first payroll. Just go to gusto.com slash design better. That's gusto.com slash design better. I love the idea of externalizing the conversation as a starting point because then it feels a little less dangerous that it's not necessarily about me or about you. It's about something else I see in the world. Yeah. And that could have been better. And what's the lesson that we could take from that as a 
as a way to crack open that conversation, which is a good bridge to intention versus impact, which you mentioned earlier in the conversation, which is these two words that I, I keep seeing pop up lots of places, maybe because I, I you introduced me to it and now I'm seeing it in a lot of places. But we had one of our good friends on the podcast a while back, Benjamin Evans, who's at Airbnb, super sharp guy. And Airbnb is a great example of a company that has such good intentions that they want to create trusting relationships between hosts and guests. And even when they have when we have good intentions, our impact can be pretty devastating yeah. if, uh, if we're, we're not well informed. And so in the case of Airbnb, and there's a ton that they've done to address this, including hiring smart people like Ben, but hosts would get requests for bookings. They would see a profile photo and names and some information. And that the intention was to create a trusting relationship, a human to human interaction. But it inadvertently started to impact African-Americans exponentially more than other people who were requesting a booking. And so they got denied. And so then that led to a lot of other things. And they've since built like a trust team. They've done a lot to address this and they don't show profile photos anymore. So they, they try to reduce the biases that show up in those, those early relationships. So that's an example of impact versus intention. But I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. Like, how do you see that Maybe just explain it a little bit more so we can all understand it. And then how do you see that manifesting in the tech industry? As I mentioned earlier, most of us are socialized to think that our intention is our impact, especially in business. So if you just think about very dumbed down stereotypical vision that we have of a, a tech company, it's like, oh, I want to create this thing. It's going to be the best of you know whatever kind that humanity's ever seen. Let's do it. Even at that level, and this is something that's within our framework, how do we conflate what intention is at a very basic level from what impact is, right? So intention is personal to you and your team. It's just something that you're ruminating about, having conversations with people on your team about, let's say, whereas impact is how it lives out in the actual world with actual people and communities. And so one of the things that we always advocate for is just at that very early on level, just asking very simply the question, what's the worst case scenario in on whom? And so that's like a brainstorming exercise is a critical question that you personally can ask yourself. And it could be any level of project or if it is specifically a tech product, right? That could be a whole brainstorming exercise that you do with a team. And it's not that we can tell the future, right? It's not that we're fortune tellers. It's like, definitely this is what's going to happen if we do this. But it does align our brain in a different kind of way to thinking about expanding out who we think that we're creating these things for, and even why. And it might change our entire thinking around why we're building this thing or even what our approach will be around it at a very, very early age, which can potentially alleviate a lot of the later issues or snafus mm -hmm. or colossal disasters or whatever have you. And so, yeah, that's just something that we have seen in pretty much every single industry. It's not specific to tech at all, but it's like going back to the philanthropy thing or foundations or nonprofits, which that's part of my background is I worked at a lot of nonprofits before we even met together as editors at a magazine and seeing Okay, nonprofits, especially you think, oh, they're doing great things, right? They're helping communities. And even at that level, they're not asking these questions, like what could go wrong? Yeah, there's there's a great book for those listening, Winners Take All. Yes, oh, that's so funny. Yes, we're just, just, talking just we're talking, yeah. That. Such, such a good book. So if you're interested in this topic, like benevolent intentions and negative impacts that can happen, that's a worthwhile read. Yeah, yeah that's a sign that we need to purchase it and buy Probably, it. Yeah, yeah, and read it. Um, Oh, man, there's so much to say. Okay, the example, the Airbnb example is a great example. Mm -hmm. I think it's great because, you know, Airbnb did not create racism. That whole scenario is just a macro of what has been happening to people of color, black yeah. folks forever. That's you look right. at redlining, look at all these right. other things, right? So there's nothing new about that. Right. And what is the solution to that? I understand that Airbnb is like, well, we're going to take away, you know, photos of blah, blah, blah. Okay, so then I don't have my photo up, but then I show up at a home that I booked. 
and yep. I'm being treated a certain way or I'm feeling not safe or I'm feeling uncomfortable because X, Y, Z, right? It's like there's so many things to consider and think about. Like, how do we solve and redesign these things at the root? Mm. And for something like that, it's so complex. Mm. I don't have an answer for that right now. It's kind of beyond what they can control, but there are some things that they do. Like their illustration design system is fantastic. It shows people of all races, genders, backgrounds, shapes, sizes, families that are blended. It shows interactions across races of like, hey, here's the key to the house or whatever. That's priming. Yes. That's kind of like setting the stage of saying like, this is the interaction that you may have. So those sorts of things, they don't necessarily solve the problem, but they can at least speak to it. Exactly. Yeah. That's, you took the words out of my mouth. That is so critical. What are low hanging fruit? What are things that we can solve or, you know, start to work on right now? And then what are these other things that are going to take time and effort and also being in the discovery mindset and testing out? There are so many things to think about. And, you know, the other thing I want to say, this is in regards to the conversation we had earlier today, is we're all complicit also. We have iPhones. We wear Nikes. We do have good intentions. And there are, there are impacts that we're causing out in the world all the time. There's all these things to grapple with. And I say that because it doesn't mean that we don't try. It doesn't mean that we don't have courage to discover and to forge a path forward within all of these contradictions and complexities. And something that we share that also makes me think of this conversation because it's really important where when and I are not coming to this necessarily from like the self-righteous place. I mean, maybe sometimes once in a while, but you know what I mean? Like, you know, we're super passionate about it, but we're also not immune and not all biases are the same. I would never say, well, we all have biases. Yeah, we do. Not all are created equal. Some have greater influence than others, but you know, we like to share with people, we like to tell on ourselves. And, you know, we created, along with co-creators and some co-producers, a video interview series called Fit the Description that highlighted Black male civilians and Black male police officers having one-on-one conversations about their experiences with and within law enforcement. And this was after the murders of Alton Sterling and Flando Castile. And we wanted to do something and we really jumped right in. And there's something to be said about that. We learned a lot, you know, we discovered a lot, but we share this because we had 30 people on our team. All of one were people of color, over half were Black men. And the civilians that we brought together to participate were Black men from various backgrounds, you know, educators or artists or et cetera. And it wasn't until we were well along in a Northeast tour, touring this, this series that an older Black gentleman came up to us and pointed out that we had no people who were formerly incarcerated in our series. And he was formerly incarcerated. And it was really, we felt humiliated and a little bit ashamed. And like, how could we have missed that? How did we miss that? And I felt defensive. And I Mm -hmm. think that's important to say too, because that's often the reaction is, well, we didn't mean to do that. And and also maybe our intention wasn't to have formerly incarcerated people in it. You know, it just had a yeah. really immediate reaction that was reactionary. Yeah, you know, and that's real. Like, that's honest. You know, mm-hmm. your, our, our intentions were great. Mm-hmm. We really wanted to create something that was blah, blah, blah. But we like to share that because when we think about these things, as you said earlier, but when it's often talked about as the right thing to do or the business case, at the end of the day, we would have created a better film. The actual content would have been more robust and nuanced and interesting. It would have done the intention of the whole series justice, full justice, to have included those different perspectives. And it's not that we're bad people, it's that we weren't looking for who we were excluding because our assumption was, well, this is our community, these are our people, we don't need to do that. We're the experts. We're experts. And if we really are being honest and looked at the composition of our team, most of us were from similar educational backgrounds or neighborhoods, you know, all of those things. So we think it's really important to bring that up. And what's really critical about this example is that had we have been taking our own advice and using our framework, there is no way that we would have missed that we were excluding that 
perspective. And it also doesn't mean that had we now identified, oh, we're excluding X, you know, one, two, three, and four, that now we have to include everybody. But we would have gotten to choose. We would have gotten to choose. Yes, we're including this because of this. No, we're not including this perspective because of X, Y, Z, as opposed to being kind of in La La Land, completely unaware. I'm curious how you guys think about, so there's all these different dimensions of diversity. And I'm I'm thinking specifically about this project that John Maida did with some students in coal country in in Kentucky, I think, where, you know, there are certain voices that are just left out of tech and we don't, maybe we don't talk about them as much. So I'm trying to think about how you guys might address like these different elements of diversity, like geographic diversity or economic diversity and how you advise companies on on addressing those parts of the, the spectrum too. We just always want to point people back to our framework because we've developed it for such a long time with so many collaborators who are experts in all these different areas that we're not experts in. And the thing is that, again, this isn't specific conversation to race or gender or anything like that. It really is a way to pull the lid off to see, okay, well, what are our cultural defaults here? And every, again, you know, going back to the beginning, everybody has their cultural defaults. As Jahan said, they're not all created equal. They don't all have the same potential for harm. But looking at that from the very beginning, from a team perspective, let's say you're working at a company. Well, who are we? That's a really important question to just start off with. If you have done nothing around diversity, equity, inclusion, a starting point could just be, who are we? Who is on this team? Let's just take a look around. What are our perspectives? What are our backgrounds and how could that potentially impact how we're thinking about design or building or what we're building or staffing or any aspect of whatever it is that you're working on? And the other thing is, well, why do we care about this? What would it provide? What possibilities could it provide? And I think that that's a really good opening to see, okay, where can we start to go to work on this first? Because diversity, equity, inclusion isn't just relegated to hiring, retention, recruitment in tech, let's say, which is there's so much emphasis of those things in that one area, which is great. It's really, really great. But then also, how are we building things? How are we thinking about that? How are we telling our stories to the point that Jahan just made about when we made that huge snafu and then we realized, oh, we haven't thought critically or thoughtfully about how we're even messaging what this project is about and why. So if you think about these things in the very beginning, you're not going to necessarily be targeting or reaching every single community that might be excluded, but you'll know very well why you're focusing on some and not on others for this particular thing that you're building out versus another thing that you're building out. It's just all those little levels. And some of it is just asking a question. Some of it is more complex in terms of redesigning a whole system. There's so many layers to it, but there's always going to be a starting point. And that's the thing that we really want to bring to people's attention is that this is not an amorphous, like, what do we do now type of conversation. It really is like, what is the starting point that's going to make sense for where we're at by just simply asking the question, who are we? And it is a lot. So, and we just also want to say that too. We're not like, this is so easy. Everybody go do it. But what we are saying is that it's totally doable. And we all, it's not like we all have a part to play, but we all have to create the sustainable, livable, thriving future for people knowing that there's an environmental crisis (laughs) and all of these other things that are actually at the end of the day, equity issues. You know, Eli, what you were pointing to, there's like all these different kind of levels or measures of diversity. I think sometimes when we, people speak about them, when we speak about them, it's very like race, gender, class, et cetera. And there's so much overlap in between. Those things don't necessarily fit neatly into these categories. One person can be in all of these different categories. And ultimately the entire purpose of our framework is to bring in people from various communities to design and lead on what you're building. There's no way around it. It's an incredible opportunity and it is aligned with the future. Like to create equitable anything, we have to have those perspectives present and those design decisions present. And it's, again, it's not because it's the nice thing to do or the right thing to do. It's not a nice thing. It's actually hard. It doesn't always feel nice. It's not about right or anything like that. It's really like, this is going to create, again, the greatest X 
possible. It's really actually what makes sense. And there has to be a total reframing of how we even view this because it can be viewed as, oh, I'm going to lose. If Mm -hmm. you have mostly white men on a team or running a company, the occurrence can be, well, then I'm going to lose out. I'm going to miss out, et cetera. What we're really speaking about is this is actually a benefit. This is a total benefit. And the other thing is like, I think the other myth that comes up a lot around DNI conversations is about how it's going to stifle creativity. And so why we bring this into a design conversation is that it's all about creativity. It's all about problem solving, right? So if mm-hmm. we're coming at it from that lens and everybody is a designer and we're all here having this conversation, then hopefully we lift off some of those constraints that are just in, let's say, a typical corporate diversity, equity, inclusion conversation or diversity, inclusion conversation that is all about constraining what you're really thinking or minimizing the confrontations that will happen. I do have a question for you. So we're, we've talked about some of the things that we can do inside of our teams. And in your framework, there's also the all people phrase of like all people X, Y, and Z, which is a way for us to kind of stage our assumptions of what we think about and then poke holes in it. And we'll link up the, the framework in the show notes. But I'd like to talk about how we close the loop. So bringing it into our design process, thinking about who's not being included in our thinking and our, and our design process. And then we make a thing and we put it in the world. How do we close the loop to understand the actual impact that we've had on communities that we may not have considered? So if you hadn't had this gentleman come up to you and say, hey, here's this big gap, you wouldn't have known to go out and look for that. So how do we proactively go look for our impact on communities that we're maybe not thinking about? We spend a lot of time with teams around equitable partnerships So a lot of times what happens is, okay, so typically people don't do anything at all, right? So it's like, yeah, we user test this. Oh, with who? With three people in my department who look just like me and come from the same place as me. Okay, it's like, okay, well, we're not going to probably get a varied sample there, you know? Or if people do kind of test with different communities or get feedback, it's like a one-off. It's like, oh, we did a focus group in the very beginning, but we never communicated with them afterwards, Or we did a focus group at the very end in reaction to something that went awry. Mm -hmm. And now we're like, oh, no, what went wrong? Let's get some folks in. Let's debrief. Let's figure it out. Right. But what we're really talking about is consistent, ongoing loops with the community that you are trying to reach or the community that, you know, that you're bringing in to build what it is that you're building and creating that relationship where They are leaders in this. They're also decision makers. They're designing this. And to have that ongoing communication means that we become present to how things are shifting and evolving and what we're discovering along the way. Because we all know that when we build something, you build it at point A, and by the time it gets to point D, you're like, oh, this isn't what I thought it was going to look like. Or it has elements of what I thought, but it also has this, and that's cool, and we got rid of this because we saw this. So if you're not like in constant partnership with these communities in a way that is equitable and respectful, where your people experience themselves being really valued as leaders, then it's like, how do you know? You won't know. I mean, going back to the example with the gentleman who was formerly incarcerated, we doubled back. We ended up bringing in that voice. We ended up partnering with an organization that is run by formerly incarcerated folks who are developing leadership skills. We had to do that to really see where our own blind spots were and then really get like, now what was the feedback on that? What else do we need to know? What else don't we see? It has to be an ongoing process. The one-off is not sufficient. Yeah. And the other thing to say about this is that it's definitely not prescriptive, right? And it's like what your company looks like, your organization is probably very different than ours. But the thing, just going back to the core concept there is how do you build these relationships from the very beginning and how do you keep them going and have direct communication where you're asking those communities, does this still work? Is this solution still needed? What is the feature or function here that you would adjust? Why does it work? Why does it not work? And sometimes it can be really, really simple. But one thing to say, just going back to the macro 
stuff is that we once spoke to one of the top tech companies in the world and all of their research and development teams were housed in Europe and North America. And this is a global company that services people in over 100 countries. So we already just know fundamentally that it's not a morality thing. It's not a business case thing. It's just like, that's not going to work. There's a fundamental workability issue here because you're going to just miss so many different things. So the solution to your question in that context, I mean, there's so many different layers to it, but just starting off with what are the hyper-local communities here and how do they interact with these assumptions that you're making and these hypotheses that are being built into these tools that are going to be shipped globally, right? There's probably some sort of mechanism at a very low level to start with that's low hanging fruit that they can just start to test out. So it really is in the discovery of the companies that are in the inquiry of these questions. Oh, okay. Who do we need to talk to? What would an equitable partnership look like for them by asking them? And then those mechanisms and the actual logistics around that will reveal themselves. And then through this muscle memory and building these things, we'll have better and better best practices around them. We typically finish off the podcast with a question about what's inspiring you right now. And it could be a book, it could be a person, it could be a podcast. But yeah, something that you're, that you're really enjoying right now that you're finding inspiration in. Well, for me, it's this emerging field that we happen to fall into called equity design. And we didn't know that there's so many of us out there who are asking these questions. And it really is this intersection of design thinking, design strategy, and diversity, equity, inclusion. But like even deeper than that, you know, there are people who are in this field who are anthropologists or people in this field who are scholars. And it's just kind of meeting our family in a way that is surprising to us because we're certainly not the pioneers of this. We're just asking similar questions and coming up with tools that look very similarly, but are meant for different fields, different communities. And that's dope. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What about you? Oh, man, I'm leaning towards literature, art and culture, because that's where our mind kind of goes a lot. So many things are actually inspiring. I'll just say Adrienne Marie Brown, because we were talking about her earlier, and she's Mm -hmm. really amazing. She wrote this book called Emergent Strategy. And it's it's really inspiring because it's one of the most unique books I've ever read. It's not meant to be read linear. So you can pick it up and open up to a different chapter. Some of it are like facilitation tools she's used. Some is like pulling from uh, Octavia Butler, who's this famous Black woman, science fiction Afrofuturist. Afrofuturist writer. She's quoting Drake in it as well. Mm-hmm. There's just like a lot of things happening, but it's very loving and it's really graceful and it's really, it's genuinely inspiring. And she studies a lot of different ecosystems and, you know, looking at different animals and Mycelium insects and- yeah, and daffodils or something. And, yeah. and basically how can we use this as a model for how humans can sustain? And really what she is promoting and espousing is a whole other type of way for humans to be in communion with one another. And it's like, well, if this type of insect has lived for this long because they work towards a goal together in this way, what can we learn that we can bring into how we live as humans? It's really a beautiful, unique read that's Mm -hmm. always on our desk. And I highly recommend actually to everyone. For our listeners who are in teams who feel like your expertise could help them, where could they learn more about you and get in touch with you? They can come to our website, mm-hmm. <laughs> projectinkblot.com, and they can just communicate to us right there. And we're starting to write more so people can reach out any way that they, whatever their preference is, social media, we're on there, Instagram, Project Inkblot, Twitter, which we really use, LinkedIn, which we're learning how to use, <laughs> yeah. all those good ways, mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> That's fantastic. Boy Wen and Jahan, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Thank, yeah, you. thank you. So thanks much. for having us. It was such a pleasure. <laughs>